And so we intro the folks here. Uh, you're tuned into Waters Garden Center's um, Garden Channel, and we are talking today about privacy screens, how to block your neighbors out. Perfect for you folks that have a new hot tub and you just want to jump in there and do your own thing, or, or that neighbor that has a Class A RV and they just parked it like in your face and you want to block that thing, or a garden shed, or, or I had a contractor once that, uh, I'm just going to take this, Kenzie, and get it where that thing doesn't trip. So it's just begging for, there we go. Uh, I had to hide his debris pile because he was a contractor, We'd do work and all the extra stuff, there's always a little bit left over. Pile it right there where I could visually see it and benefit from it. It was terrible, it's not a good neighbor, but there's ways to block out bad neighbors. So my name is Ken Lane. I am the owner of the garden center. I'm the second generation owner. And so my, I married a Waters. So Harold Waters is the founder of the company and he had four daughters. I married the youngest and prettiest daughter, Lisa. She's working here today. And then we've had children. We have four children, three daughters and one son. And Mackenzie, my daughter, is the third generation that's taking over the next, hopefully she'll take the next 30 years. We've got 60 years in business this last spring. So March 16th or 19th, I forget what the day is, but basically spring of 1962, Waters Garden Center began. So that's kind of our background. We have seen the town go from little, we're still not big, but it sure feels big compared to what I was when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s. It was kind of way smaller, way more intimate, way, it was just Prescott too. It wasn't, uh, oops, maybe just a bit hot. Turn it down just a touch. So my assistant's on vacation. Dang it, Ken Davis, he usually runs this back for us. So bear with us a little bit. We know you're online. I know that squeal hurts you, but it hurts us more here in, in, the, in the greenhouse. So, so where do you go with this? I, I would say number one thing you can do if you need privacy or you just want your landscape to mature faster, you need bigger stuff or that, that the oaks and the and the pine trees that were left over between you and your neighbors, you want them to fill in faster. Sometimes they're under great stress when you're putting your, your house in. I mean, they're not used to having heavy equipment run over their root zone. They're not used to having, they're actually damaged just not even doing that. They're just, they have roots everywhere. They get damaged. So they're, they're trying to readjust. The best thing you can do, the first advice I can give you is fertilize everything this fall. That will set the stage for far better growth next spring. So it's going to set the stage. In fact, you're already seeing uh, flower buds and leaf buds forming now. You're seeing fall. I mean, we just had uh, the winter or the autumn equinox just happened this week. And that's a cue. The days are getting shorter. Plants are going to go, oh, it's time to show off our colors. You'll see the maples go in first. You'll see the locust that go in next. And there'll be this wave of color. Aspens will be right behind that. But, but as they're doing that, they're storing up their sugars, carbohydrates, and they're, they're in the root zones and also in the leaf buds and flower buds. And so you're, you're setting the stage now, the most important feeding of the entire year right now, now through October. Um, I would definitely fertilize my native plants. Uh, that's, that's not what you read all the time on, on the uh, internet, whatever, Google, but I do it myself and it makes a big difference. Uh, your junipers. Your, your oaks, uh, your hackberries, the, the, the pines, pinions, and ponderosas, I would fertilize those because you can have a catch-up year. They've been under just such stress the last five, six years. They really got damaged, and this is a recovery year. And so you can really get another ring of growth next year just by fertilizing now, and it'll make a big difference next spring on the trunk size and then the, the tip growth. So it can fight off those tip borers flathead borers, Ips beetle, all these things that attack local natives, they can recover with a little bit of care from the, from the garters. Don't go crazy. Once should do it for natives, whereas your regular ornamental plants, they need a little bit more often. So they need about four times a year. So spring, summer, fall. Yeah, if you think in holidays, think, think Easter, 4th of July. Usually the rains start about the 4th of July. It can be a little bit before or after, but generally about then, you can take advantage of that summer rain, which we've had a good one this year. Uh, again, over three, I think I measured 3.2 inches of rain at our garden, in our house, just, just a couple miles away. So it's been a good rain year, 
at least here. So I think for the, for most of the North Country, it's been very wet. It's been good. Now all we need is some snow. This winter will be a game changer. That'll really front load all the groundwater will be will be out of this drought, and it happens like that. Um, so fertilized fall, most important Halloween. And then I think the evergreens, especially if you want your evergreens to grow fast, we'll go over a couple of them that are kind of used the most for, for uh, privacy screens. Uh, but I would fertilize in the winter, New Year. That'll just set the stage. Your, your evergreens only get one shot at growth. And that's it. Whatever locks in in spring, that's all you get. Then it solidifies and you wait till the following spring, except for junipers. Anyway, it's good to fertilize them then. Uh, I have three handouts for you today. One's on food, and I'll go over a little bit more on what I'm doing in my gardens right now, my personal gardens, what I personally do. But I have a handout. I'll go in a little deeper because you're at the class than I have in the handout. But if you're a note taker, you'll have this a PDF one-page document that kind of tells you spring, summer, fall, the dates, that, what I just told you. Uh, I have a book that I wrote on privacy screens. Everything we're covering today is in this 60-page book, full color. It'll be a PDF download. I don't have a printed copy, but digital copy read on your iPad or desktop, or whatever. And there was a third one. Oh, that noise you're hearing? Everyone keeps, keeps asking. So I just put together a handout going, what's that noise? Cicada, what's the life cycle? What do they do? Where are they at? Are they dangerous? Will they come at night and lay eggs in your pillow or they burrow into your brain? They don't do that. They don't even have a mouth part. But I just thought for fun, for trivia, I'd give that one too. So you have three things. Um, you're going to be to your email address, and you folks online, I know you You should come in. You should be here. So you'd get a personal uh, invite, but uh, you're seeing in, your, in the comment box to the right, uh, you see the links showing up there where the, you can print those out too. Okay, so this, I'll hand this to you, and I'll personally take care of this this afternoon because my assistant's gone, so you'll get an email from me, and then if ever you want a garden question, shoot, you'll have my email. You can just kind of go, hey, Ken, wonder what this is. It's actually amazing how many people, since they've got a phone, they just go click. I got Ken's email. Hey, Ken, what is this? And went, it's a weed. Well, what kind of weed? I have no idea. It's a weed. Get rid of it. It's no good. So just kind of fun. Um, okay, food. Let's go over that in detail. Rain like crazy. You can see the whole nursery. We just, there was this wave of water that went through the garden center yesterday. So we're trying to pick up, clean up, because we have a major event tomorrow night. We've got a fundraiser called Grapes for Good. You are personally invited. You can, there'll be tickets at the door. Of our help, we wrote, we partnered with uh, Barry uh, with El Gato Azul. He's uh, he's a very famous chef in town. He's pairing wines with this food. Uh, and then we get together, and there's some auction stuff, and just a fun garden party. Super relaxed. Come like you are. It's a Prescott event anyway. You always come. We always go how we are. Uh, be after hours, Sunday from five to eight, we'll raise a hundred grand for local nonprofits, schools mainly, but it's just a big fundraiser. It's a who's who of the area. Bring a friend, it's super fun. So 60 bucks tickets at the door. So anyway, invite, so we got to clean up for that. So uh, fertilizing, what am I doing in my own? I will do this by the end of October. So you don't feel rushed, but I want to take advantage of the rains, and I know what's going to happen. They're turning color. I know, I know the structure, the botany of the plants. So I want to take advantage of that and encourage more of it so I get better growth next spring, especially if you want hedgerows and big green, you know, blocking every, if you have a brand new landscape and it just doesn't look mature yet, fertilize really makes a difference. What I'm doing with mine, let me get my uh, chair over here if I got that. So I can show stuff off without breaking my back. Sorry to be off screen for a second for you folks online. There we go. How's that look? Can you see it okay? Seems like that camera's a little cocked or something. Am I still in the... Oh, perfect. So I'm just going to fertilize everything in the yard with all-purpose plant food. It's a granular food. Put it in my hand spreader, and I just fertilize everything. Uh, and it's going to fertilize the plant, the landscape for the next three months. It's going to break down real slowly. Every rain, every snow that comes now through the end of the year, it's going to break down. It also has a lot of cottonseed meal and a lot of sulfur in it and iron, some other fairy dust. we got all kinds of stuff in here. 
uh, but it'll help green things up so it kind of gets a richer, deeper color to it. And it'll help flower, it'll help your like lilacs, forsythian spring, fruit trees, that kind of stuff. It'll help them to uh, actually blossom better next spring. So this is the thing I do for everything. Lawns, flowers, hedges, evergreens, deciduous, your crepe myrtles to your, to, and everything in between, fertilize them. If you fertilize now, you'll get better color too because it lowers that pH. You'll get a brighter color out of your maples, purpley plums. You just see a better, richer autumn color. Uh, so that's what I do. Fruit trees are a little different. Fruits, grapes, berries, uh, figs, uh, pomegranates. That uh, we make a special food just for those. That's really specialized, but that's we. It's called fruit and vegetable food. But we front loaded that with a lot of calcium, so it increases the size of fruits. But this is for everything else, all-purpose plant food. Okay. In addition, especially new things, especially things that are stressed. If it has brown or curl or spot or any kind of leaf problem, also at the same time, give it humic. This is humic acid, H-U-M-I-C. Humic is uh, organic gardeners. It's, that's the, if you take a compost pile, you just break it down to its last elements, what you have is humic acid. And it looks like that. It's a granulated chocolate mocha looking thing. Wear gloves, you're gonna get dirty. It's an organic, uh, thing, but what it does, it feeds the roots, the soil, so the roots want to go deeper into the soil. So if your plants were stressed by construction, that is, you have backhoes in there underneath the, 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 the drip line of your junipers or pines, they are stressed, but some of this will help it root back out. If you got a brand new landscape, the secret to brand new landscapes, you need the roots. Once the roots get in there, it just takes off and starts growing. Anything that's stressed out, it's probably root damage, either from root rot, got dried out, something happened where this will help it to reroot. So you have a bigger root mass, it'll take it more fertilizer, and it just goes. So those are two things. And one last thing, kind of an insider tip just from me. For things I want bright color on, so right now I'm feeding my, fruit, my uh, lilacs. I have quite a few lilacs in, in the yard. They have been in bloom nonstop since April. Uh, Bye. I chuck a hand of, and this is not in the handout, this is just for the class. Uh, super phosphate, this is 0, 18, 0, the numbers. Again, nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. Nitrogen has green growth. Uh, phosphorus is for flowers. Here you go. You can post that hashtag Waters Garden Center. Instagram, yeah, TikTok. If you want, I'll just TikTok for you. There we go. Yeah, we can add movement. Anyway, this is going to increase your flowers. And so some, especially when we've had a real wet year, a lot of the nutrients get flushed out of the soils. And so your spring bloomers won't perform as well. They'll, they'll, you've, you've flushed out a lot of the, the phosphorus, that middle number. This is what's going to increase that flower size. So uh, blooming crab apples, uh, purple leaf plums, all those spring bloomers, this is super important. Uh, this has got some, this has some of it in there already, seven, four, 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 four percent. Uh, but this will add 18. So I just chuck a few handfuls. Make, I don't think about it. If you read some folks, they say, oh, you got to work in the ground eight inches and make sure it dissolves. And just get it on the ground. I find it works. Just get it on the ground. You don't have to make complication out of it. So, yes, sir. Yeah, triple 16 is a synthetic or, or chemical fertilizer. It's petroleum base. It's, that's where carbon comes from petroleum. Um, I don't push that. I used to sell a 10, 10, 10 kind of thing. But now I'm kind of anti-chemical and more organic. And I think you can get far better acting, far better for our drinking water supply. Because 16, 16, 16, most of that is even picked up by the plants. So just like yesterday's water event. How many got rain at their house yesterday? Yeah, over half of us. Most of that would have been picked up and go right downstream. And then it gets in the, it just gets recycled the water table and we get to drink it later. And I'm going to sell three, three semi loads of fertilizer this year. Last thing I want to do is I, I can actually personally poison all of us by myself by selling the wrong fertilizer. So we, we switched over to complete organics or natural products just for, for that. As a town grows, you just kind of learn, whoa, we got a lot of us now. Used to be a few of us. You could go 16, 16, 16. 
and it wasn't a problem. But now, if you're on a well at all, don't, don't use synthetics. I mean, use natural fertilizers. You can poison yourself. It can go back into your water table and you pick it back up, put it in the water tank and drink it later, flush the toilets later with that same stuff. So anyway, just a, something, but that is the difference. Um, okay, that's fertilizer. So Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, the most important feeding. So sometime between now and Halloween, you should fertilize, do this. And then um, for the evergreens especially, uh, New Year's. With the same stuff. This stuff every time. Don't complicate it. Don't go, but I have a, don't think, don't you have a spring food, a summer food, and a fall food? Just, you'll see winterizer being promoted now. You don't need it to say winterizer. Plants don't read. They just want a good food that's balanced, that breaks down slowly so they can pick it up as they need it. So anyway, at one point I, was, I sold geranium food and pansy food and fruit tree food and three lawn foods, uh, uh, an evergreen tree food, a flowering tree food. It was stupid. That's a fertilizer company's way of getting you to buy more. That's all it is. Just get a good food and that's all you need. Uh, so, okay. So what I have are some evergreens that are fast. I'll show you how to read how fast they go. I'll show you the very fastest and some of the most popular. Uh, I've got vines because some of you have fences. But you can take advantage of that and just have it grow an extra two, three, you know, some of them are five to six foot fences typically. You can kind of sort of see over them. I can show you how to just kind of go boom. You ain't seeing over this anymore. They're fast growing. They're easy to care for. So I'll show you some of those. Um, and then some shrubs, the most popular shrub to, I think, better shrubs. So that's kind of the format I set up for you. And then I'll show you how to space them all in about, I don't know, 30 minutes or so. Sound, sound about right? So let me take a quick swig. It is crazy humid. I got back from Kansas City two days ago. That's a great little town I've never been before. It's, it's kind of reminds me of Grand Rapids. It's clean, it's neat, it's safe. It's, it's a city, but it's small. And so you just feel, and there's a lot going on in there. They have, they're just big enough to have all the arts. Hallmark is right there and they fund everything. Hallmark gift cards, they're founded right there. And they just are big giver. They just give back to the community. You can tell. So, and it's a river city. The Missouri River goes right through it. So, what's funky is how many have been there before? Yeah, half of us. So, half a can. There's two Kansas cities. One's in Missouri. One's in Kansas. I can't tell the difference, but there's two cities, and don't cross them up because they'll tell. They'll call you on it. It's the weirdest thing ever. And the Missouri River kind of calls it, going, "Don't." Here's the here's the boundary. It's just interesting how cities kind of form. We won't, we won't even go into the Tri-Cities. Back in the 70s and 80s, we only had one high school. Everyone bust into Prescott High School. Prescott Valley, Skull Valley, Chino Valley, we all bust into here. And it was kind of a camaraderie, kind of brought the whole county together. Now we're all three distinct things. That's how things grow up. So evergreens, the absolute fastest grower of all Theodore Cedar. And I don't know if I'm on camera. Can, can, do you have to follow this at all? Am I still on or not sure where to go? Probably pan over there. This thing is so heavy, it rains, so everything's at maximum weight. This is Theodore Cedar. This will grow easily two, three feet a year. It'll grow this much pretty easy, okay? The problem with this one is it is not for people with small yards. It will envelop your house. It's 80 foot tall by 25 feet wide. It's a monster. So it's cute up front. Look how cute it is. Gosh. But it's going to grow this much next year. So um, it's not for everyone, but it's great for bigger properties out on the corner. We're going to be out there where it can have space to grow. Uh, as long as your neighbor doesn't mind sharing that tree with you, because it is going to go over to their yard and your yard. Usually where we're spacing these out are like, like Chino Valley, Williamson Valley, where we, we, we can see across the way and we see the neighbors corral. And corrals are not pretty. I mean, if you're in equine and stuff, it's great. Your horse is great, but seeing your neighbor's horse and their dung pile, not as great. So you kind of block them right there before the dry wash. You see it and you, they just grow, they fill in pretty fast. But you'll see these quite a few places around town uh, and they're, they're really happy here. Just don't put it by the house. The biggest mistake I find with these is people put them by their driveway. 
And then within three years, they can't pull their truck into the drive because this thing, and then they start limiting them up and it's counter to what they wanted because now they got to limit up to truck height or car height, whatever it is, so they can walk underneath or because uh, the tree is just growing out. And that's how you get out of that. You just limb up from the bottom and then it keeps swooping down, but 25 by 80, fast. A better choice, Colorado spruce. These are native. We've got Spruce Mountain right here you can walk to. They adapt and, and go native on us pretty quick. Um, if ever you want to know how fast an evergreen grows, especially spruce, pine, and fir, um, this is this is last year's, this is this year's growth. That's how much it grows. There you go. Now you know how much. You don't have to even ask. You can look at that and go, that's how much it grows. Because so it only shoots up growth once. Then it waxes over and kind of solidifies, becomes real rigid and drought hardy. And then it just, and it's setting up buds. These are all the buds for next spring. It's setting buds and it will do this again next spring. So they'll quickly grow in dimension high. Could, spruce and fir, they grow three, 360. So they go up and out all at once. So they get pretty thick. So this will be easily, they go to the moon too, but it's smaller. And it, should, it takes a longer time. Uh, but but in, in 10 years, you're probably up to pretty good 15 feet by 20 feet. Nah, 10 feet. It's more like this, Christmas tree shaped. But it's going to be, it's going to grow 18 inches a year. Just You can calculate it yourself going, oh, in, eight, in five years, it's going to be way above my head and pyramid shaped. So once it gets up to size, you can probably cut it off of all care. I'd probably water it once a month, twice a month at most. It's probably good enough because it is a native. It grows wild here. So there are, it can get too big. This goes up to 60 feet pretty easy. Uh, older ones you'll see around town. Um, they can be 60 by 20. Pretty good. It takes them a while to get there, but 10 years, you got a substantial tree that's pretty sizable. Probably don't park this one underneath the power lines. Probably don't park it by the steps going up to the upper part of the property. It's probably going to over swoop out and get kind of encroach on someone. So place them right in the right space. Super important. Um, so you can see through it right now, but pretty short order, you won't be able to see through it because it's as thick as for me to you, me to, me to the camera. There you go. Um, I wanted to bring it mainly for that lesson. Everyone always asks, how, how fast does it grow? Not much, but in the ground, it will grow even faster. So most evergreens, they don't really do a lot that first year. They kind of just sit there and look at you. Um, I should have brought up an Arizona cypress. Oops. The number one seller, Arizona cypress, the native, it grows 20 by 12, kind of this color, kind of, kind of looks like a juniper. Um, but instead of a berry, it puts on a little tiny pine cone about this big. So that's, that's how I tell the difference between the two. If it's putting a berry on, it's a juniper. If it's putting a cone on, it's an Arizona cypress. That's probably the number one seller, Arizona cypress, uh, just because it grows so fast. But that first year, it doesn't grow. It sits there in roots. It doesn't really. And then the next year, it just goes, it just doubles me inside. It just goes, whoosh. But it's rooting. It's just getting those roots out. As soon as the roots are out, in its place, it just takes off. And it, it will quickly, I would say, it's probably the fastest growing evergreen that's not gigantuan, just it's got some reasonable size. 20 foot, a lot of yards can take a 20 foot tall tree by 12 foot wide. Not every yard can take 80 by 25. I mean, that's as big as many of, many of your, the new yard, many lots that are, are that big. And so it can take over. So, okay. I brought this one, you put this here. Let's see how heavy this thing is. I'm just going to keep it right here because it's heavy. This is Alberta spruce. I brought it for a mistake factor, what to watch, what not to do. Um, it looks like it's got some size, uh, but this is the slowest growing evergreen you will ever find. If you've got really green thumbs, you might get two, three inches a year out of it. And it's not big. It gets up six feet. About as tall as I am, and it's just a chubby little cute teddy bear looking evergreen. It is not meant for screening. 
This is meant for raised beds, the, in containers in front of your two pillars, in front of your house, inside the garage. It's made for cutesy decorations. Put some little mini Christmas lights on them. It's you know, holidays, and they're just cute. They're not made for, for screening, but I see a lot of folks plant them to screen out a neighbor. I'm going, oh, ooh, that's a, that's a blunder. I don't want my friends. My name's Ken. We're just friends. We're neighbors talking over the fence. I don't want you making that mistake. So anyway, that's why I brought that one. There's a great, this is a great place for growing Alberta spruce, but not as a privacy screen. The other ones that are good, this is probably the most popular pine for screening or just pine period. This is Austrian pine. It's related to our ponderosa pine, they're cousins. Only this one holds its foliage right to the ground. Whereas ponderosa is basic, you're, you're planting a trunk. The foliage, it's gonna be up there. There's no foliage, it's gonna, it's gonna self prune itself way above head height. It's not a good screening plant. This one is. You put this one out in the yard in front, in front on, on mounds, along the property line, uh, it's a great place to kind of plant these at the corners of, let's say, a block wall. It's just a nice thick. It'll go easily 30 feet tall by about 15 feet wide. It's a nice straight trunk uh, with branches coming out. Classic pine tree shape. So it's a good good plant for here. And the bugs are less prone to eat this. So uh, a bark beetle is known to get into ponderosas. Scale is used to getting onto pinion pines. This does not have either of those much, much more robust. This, these two actually, I'll bring both in. Let's see if I, now I'll bring them in. Can I do them at the same time? I'll do this. Ah. These are junipers. Now, some of you are gonna go, oh, juniper, I don't want a juniper. Let's, let me give, let me just give you, let me tell you why junipers are so great. They grow wild here, this is a juniper country. They're everywhere. They adapt. Things don't eat them. They're just a good, robust plant. Now, for you folks that have allergies, this little tiny plant is going to make zero difference to your allergies because the big old male junipers that are out there in the forest, have you ever seen one of those go off in the spring, like in March? They, they virtually explode. They literally go poof. And this ginormous cloud, I mean, literally a cloud of pollen, and he's just going to populate the entire hillside, but that whole, whole valley of the mountains, he's gonna take every female juniper and just pollinate every one of them. So the females don't put pollen out. The males do. The males, men are the problem, not the women. And so, especially when it comes to junipers. So for us, we only sell female junipers. We don't have the males. We don't start our plants by seed. Now that's not for everyone. That's at Waters Garden Center. We only sell the females. So we're taking cuttings from the prettiest uh, uh, juniper. We'll start them, root them, and then shift them. So it takes a lot longer to grow them. But what you get is a perfectly matched uh, juniper that doesn't cause pollen issues. So there's just a quick lesson on junipers. With that being said, you now have permission to plant junipers. That's what I use myself just because there's, there's just no problems with them. They're just methodical. They keep growing. They get, they're just perfect. They're low care, you can cut them off of water and, and just you can abuse them and they still grow like, like no other plant will do. So they come in different colors. This is Wichita blue. These get up maybe 10 feet tall by six feet wide. Yeah, it's, just think like, like this, that's how they grow. So when they come in blue or they come in green, I've got some that have some yellow hues, some solid green, just they come in different colors. Uh, but basically, they're all kind of these big, thick, they're going to be as thick as me to you, times 10 feet, just solid green. And you can't see through them. What I do with mine is, maybe I can give this lesson too. This is called Spartan Juniper. It's one that I use in my own yards because I've got neighbors across the street. So classic um, view lot up above the high school. It looks like this. My neighbor got the better lot, so he's at the top of the hill. I'm just below that across the street, and I can look across the street and see his deck. And they like to sit down out and sip wine and watch sunsets while I'm out there reading the paper or whatever I'm doing. So I don't want that. So I wanted him to go away. 
And so I use Spartan junipers. And the reason I use the green instead of the blue is because I have a lot of blue in the yard already. I've got native junipers. I've got oaks. These na natural, this is kind of a natural Arizona blue color, maybe a little bit richer. So the green contrasts with my landscape, what I have. But blue may be better for you. So just pick the one. Your rock color is all crushed granite, you know, golds. Blue looks really good with gold. That's a classic combo designer color. So pick the one that they grow both the same. This is blonde brunette. That's the only difference. Just they grow the same, grow the, they're just as hardy. They're just, they're just the same. Pick the color you like, okay? The lesson I'll give you is when I planted these, I zigzagged them. I wonder if I can get another one in here. What else do I have? Let's do this one. We'll do this. Just to give you a feel for how I would design. Come over here. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's killer. Um, I've got two, I've got three raised beds that go from the street down to my house. You might have a knoll. It might be flat. It doesn't matter. It's the distance. I wanted to, I, I didn't want to create a green wall so it looked like I'm trying to hide something. That's, a, that's kind of a, that's, an, that's a traditional East Coast kind of, of, of landscape. It's like the, the plants, exact kind of plants are marching through the yard like they're soldiers going across trying to block this thing. You're going, oh, they're trying to hide something. What's over there? You just have to go look and see what's over there. So if you zigzag them, it instantly creates a, an informal type of landscape. So this zipper pattern uh, really makes it, so that's what I did. I put a row back here, and the next row down below here, I put I put a same plant, I was using I was using this juniper, but I zigzagged it. That's uh, been about five years, solid green, you can't, everything's gone, you can't even go to walk down the, the uh, sidewalk and see in, it's solid green. Uh, so, but they're not really touching. They're not overlapping. They're just individual plants, and it looks natural. In front of that, by the street, I didn't want just big green plants so that it blocks the neighbors out. That's kind of rude. But I don't want to see you, and I, don't want, and I don't want you to see me. That's not neighborly. So in front, out on the street, I put these guys out in front. And there I did put... Kind of six of them right there. They're beautiful right now. Big blue. This is Russian sage. So you have big blue spiky uh, shrub that's in bloom right now. That's Russian sage. It's a native. Grows wild. Just naturalized. In fact, right now it's got too much water. So they're just drunk. With they're just laying over, going, I can't take any more water. It's just crazy. As soon as they dry out, they'll perk back up and they'll, they'll be more upright. And then in front of these or in between these, I put some red salvia or autumn sage there's another shrub just like this it's got red flowers all over it the hummingbirds just love and they're, they're kind of they're companion plants to each other so i got this layered uh, red salvia purple sage and then this green wall and it's very very striking everyone comments about it it looks garden-esque but yet it's more it looks like it should be a botanical garden and it is it looks like that guy might own a garden center okay he does I'm just trying to be neighborly, look pretty. So anyway, zigzag. Let's cover two. Let's, let me pull this thing back here. I'll share an example of how many do you need. Whenever you need help with this stuff too, take a picture with your phone or whatever, iPad, bring it in, we can help you a lot. And what we're looking at when we look at that picture, we're not looking at the plant, we're looking at companion plants. Oh, if a lilac's growing there, I know that this will grow there too. This will work. Uh, we're looking at shadowing. What time of the day is it? Is it? Is it? I'm trying to figure out how much sun does that part of the garden get, so we can put the right plants in, so they aren't scorching, or have they'll grow faster, easier to water. We're looking at those kind of things. What you can't tell with a uh, with a picture, you can't tell distance. So you might pace it off real quick. Just get it close. Is it the entire yard? You know, is it 60 feet or is it 20 feet? You can't quite tell in the picture. So you pace that real quick. Does not have to be exact. Okay. I'll put this back up here. Ugh. I thought I worked out this morning, but now you're lifting plants and they're heavier <laughs> maximum weight. 
Austrian pine, Scotch pine. I've got pinion pines too. In fact, I've got the single needle um, pinion pine. I think it's the better one for here. It doesn't get scale as easy. It's the one you get the nuts off of. Uh, that's, a, that's a great choice. There's a lot of pine trees. This one's the most popular for screening, but by no means the only one. Okay, so spacing. Let's go to shrubs because that's a, that's a, that can be confusing. This is the number one seller uh, because the red growth, so it's all the new growth is red. It's called red-tipped photenia. Um, I would never put this in my yard, but it is the number one seller. But my kids through college with this one plant. Uh, the reason I find it's too aggressive is 12 by 12 by 12. I mean, it's so innocent looking. It grows so fast. It's usually a little cheaper than some of the other shrubs. Uh, but, but, and I try to talk people out of it, but it's, they just see it around the yard, but it's high maintenance. So if there's 10 bugs in their neighborhood, they'll get 12 of them. It's they're right now they're covered in powdery mildew. I'm selling tons of anti-fungicide stuff for folks. It's deer eat it, rabbits eat it. It's just short term, it'll be cheaper, but over the long run, it'll be a more expensive plant, more maintenance, more trimming. And then, um, Small children and dogs have been lost in this plant. I mean, it just gets so thick, so fast, and everyone wants it right by their mailbox. You're gonna be pruning, they're gonna be a slave to pruning that thing every month to keep it down that size. So it's 12 by 12 by 12. It's just solid, solid green, fast growing. Uh, this will easily put on three feet. This will quadruple in size uh, neck by next spring. So, but it is a popular one. Gets a white flower. Kind of insignificant. What you're really planting it for is this red with the green. A better choice, what I use in my yard, just because, again, we're friends. So what I use myself, I think this is a far better choice just because it's a native. It's a local native. You'll see its cousin, the blue. There's one that grows wild out in the forest. Uh, the Bradshaw is out towards Skull Valley. Uh, this blue, just really this rich, the new growth comes out real blue and like this. It looks like this, we fit, which is kind of, it's pretty, but it looks kind of native-y. So a lot of folks want some sparkle to the plant, so they kind of look better for, with their in front of their million dollar house. And so we figured out how to breed a plant that has a gold trim to it. Gives it very striking, uh, looks really good as a hedge. I use it in front of uh, that big electrical box that's yeah, APS throws in front of like every third neighbor. It's, hideous looking, it's not, it's bringing you down. So it, this is this is APS yellow. You just put one of these by it, it disappears like that. Um, I use it in my yard against the uh, cedar fence. So I've got big, I've got a half acre, it's all fence for the dogs, uh, but it looks, it looks cavernous. This is Ellie Agnes, I was getting there, hold on. Ellie, or Silverberry is the other name, Silverberry or Ellie Agnes. Uh, but it's a native plant that grows wild. It gets a white white flower that's super fragrant. You don't really see the flower, but it's super fragrant. It smells good. Uh, this one I'll get up to size. It'll easily go easily go head high, way above head high, and and, and this it goes this big. Just think eight by eight by eight, pretty fast. So I'll usually put it on irrigation when I first put it in because I want it to be fast. I want it to grow fast. As soon as it's up to size, I cut it off the irrigation and I never water it again. It's that tough. It's truly, truly a native plant. Animals don't eat it. It doesn't get any bugs that I know of. I've never seen it get any disease. I've never had an issue. Uh, and you don't have to, I like to put on the irrigation just to get it because it'll grow faster with some care. Uh, but you could just probably let it go after a couple of years and be fine. So Ellie Agnes. Another one that's equally good, equally tough, and I think a better plant, than uh, red-tipped photinia. This is cotoneaster, red clusterberry cotoneaster. You spell it cotton easter. And these will be in those handouts that are coming your way pretty shortly. This uh, big swooping branches, out probably 10 by 10 by 10, something like that. So you can easily hedge it down to this height if you choose, or you can just let it go. So I had a, uh, down. I, I raised my family in Skull Valley. We were farming down there. Greenhouses are everywhere. You're trying to heat the greenhouses. 
and you need a lot of propane to keep the house going down there. So I had a, like a thousand gallon tank, propane tank down. This thing was a submarine in your backyard. It was hideous looking. Above ground, just because it's, it's a farm. You just do things that are fast, easy, quick. So okay, I don't want to walk out my back. I like convenience of going to the greenhouses like that quick, but I don't want to see this. It's not, I had these beautiful gardens. And so I planted two of these, one on either side, one on each just in front of uh, the, the propane tank. It disappeared in a year. You could not see it. And then I let it go kind of wild. You can't formalize it and kind of keep it trimmed. You can go all Dr. Seuss on it, make it, you can do shapes. It looks naturally, just let it swoop and do its thing. It's kind of a, it's a really pretty plant. Evergreen, uh, it does get red berries. It kind of persists on that plant right through winter. The birds will like it. So it's a good, good plant. Kind of hard to find. I think we're the only one in town that, that grows it, that has it. But red cluster berry, berry cotoneas are for a big shrub. It's a great choice. And far better than I think red tip photinia. Doesn't get mildew, doesn't, doesn't have any of the issues. I'm going to go over two more. And then, just because you East Coast folks will like this. And then we'll show you how to space them. How many do you need for a length, whatever your garden is? These are euonymus. There's a lot of different kinds of euonymus. They're all evergreen. They all have this waxy leaf, which makes them very drought resistive. So they preserve their water very, very well. They easily grow up to head high, probably about this wide, maybe seven by seven by seven, something like that, solid. Uh, and the more you hedge them, the thicker they get. So they'll quickly get pretty thick on you. Uh, they come in different colors, green, uh, gold. This is kind of a silver color, silver king, golden euonymus. Their, their names aren't very original, but they've been around a long time. Very famous in the Midwest, East Coast but they think they're in the Midwest here when you plant them. Only negative, just can't, can't, just friends. Deer tend to eat this. Rabbits like the taste of them. If, you got, if you're right there in that forest interface where you have a lot of animals, probably there's better choices like these other two. A javelina I find don't bother them. It's the deer and the rabbits seem to go after them. That's, those are the main kind of culprits. So, okay, how to space them. So when you read the tag, it says eight by eight by eight, like this one, or 10 by 10 by 10, whatever the side, whatever the tag says gets, however wide it gets, cut that in half, that's your spacing for a hedge. Do you want them to have this overlapping pattern up above to the, to the highest level? That's your math. So if, we're, if you're a designer, that's how you go, how many of these are gonna need? I gotta put on the plan. You just take, you research how wide it gets, divide it in half, and that's what you do. So this one's gonna go, 10 by 10 by 10, so I'd probably put one here, and I'd probably put another one every five feet or so, I'd probably do about that spacing, and within just a year or two, they're gonna be solid overlapping. You won't be able, you won't be able to go through them. They're gonna be solid. So if, if you need a hedge, if you don't want a hedge, space them out farther. Go with what feels right. I didn't do that for my screen across the street because I didn't want this wall look. I wanted it to be more natural. And so there I zigzagged it as I described before. Then I added some more plants into that to kind of soften it up so it feels like this secret garden. I'll show you how to do that in a sec. That's how you space, if it makes sense. So whatever it is, divided by two, that's your hedge if you want a solid green wall. Vines, let's shoot to that. Ugh. So a couple, I brought this one because it's going into color all around town now. This is kind of, this announces, this in the maples, announce autumn. And they'll be in color through October, basically. And then they'll be deciduous. That is, they'll lose their leaves. This grows wild out in the forest. You'll see a plant just like this, got those five leaves to it. This is called Virginia creeper. So it just, it can be a ground cover, but it also makes a very nice crawler up, up, up walls, up pergolas. But the reason it's so good is it's native. It can actually go by itself once it gets up to size. Once you get it rooted, you can let it go and it'll be hardy. It'll look better longer if you take care of it at all, but treat it, if you're gonna water this, put it on the tree irrigation. Treat it you know, once a week, it's probably good enough for this guy. Keeps it going, okay? This will easily go probably as high as you want. 
I can easily get it to go up an eight foot fence to the top and then another two feet uh, and it'll get pretty thick. What I've done with mine is uh, once in the winter, I'll shave it back to the fence, whatever that is, or pergola or trellis, whatever you're growing it up. I'll shave it back with my hedgers as close as I can to that structure and I'll just shave off everything and then fertilize it. And that keeps it back where it doesn't look like it's trying to take over. It doesn't let you through that side patio walkway or whatever. It keeps it thicker, keeps it looking lush, keeps it looking more manicured. But once, once a year, like January through March, pick a time, shave it back. It'll be brutal. I just shave it back and then fertilize it. It will not even feel it. It will come back with even more beautiful growth next spring. Okay, Virginia creeper. These two, this is the number one seller by far. Got to cover that one. Then some new colors are coming out, which are pretty. This is Hall's Honeysuckle. This is the same one that you grew as a kid. You could pull these stamens out, you know, and you suck down the, the nectar, kind of his real sweet, sweet tasting. The bees love it, butterflies. Um, it's a pollinator. Hummingbirds love it. Uh, it's very fast grower. Easily it'll go up eight, 10 feet. So in Prescott Valley, when I had my house out there, had six foot chain link fence. Chain link is not pretty, in case you're wondering. It's hideous looking. It's right up there with barbed wire, okay? It's, it's not pretty. So I wanted to soften it. So I grew this, one of these every eight feet, they come in eight foot panels. I just put one in the middle, middle of each panel and within a year, it was just solid vine. It's very pretty, felt garden-esque, felt really good. Cut the wind. It's really, really nice. You can grow this as a ground cover. You'll see that quite often, but you can also train it to go up any wall you want. Probably needs to have a trellis of some sort to climb or train it somehow. I've seen as simple as, I've seen people literally take rebar and just lean it up against the fence. It crawls right up to wire, to trellises, to, you can get creative. But within a year, all you're gonna see is vine. It's gonna bloom with like this from April through probably October. Okay, it can be evergreen. I call it semi-evergreen. If it goes sub-zero, if it gets really cold, like you're down to five degrees for three weeks, it's gonna go deciduous. That's pretty rare for us to do, but every once in a while that happens. Most years it's got foliage on it. Not all the foliage, it's got some foliage. Super drought hardy, deer don't eat it. It's just, it's got a lot going on for it, which is why it's so popular. Um, this one, because they're so tough, we're introducing more of these colors. This is called Lemonade. What's, what's the name of this one? Uh, Gold Flame. There's a lot of different colors. This is the only one that holds its foliage consistently. All the others I would really call deciduous. You'd think they'd be the same, but I found just looking at them, they don't quite hold their foliage as much. It's, it's brief. They go without leaves, they go naked for just you know six, eight weeks, and then they're back, but it is just truly deciduous. It's gonna lose its foliage, which is probably fine. You're indoors. When it's cold that cold, you're not on the patio enjoying the sunsets. You're inside baking cookies, sipping tea. Uh, if it's by the hot tub and you're going out there in the snow, probably this is not the one for you. It's probably this one or some of these others. Okay. Honeysuckle's tremendous. And there's some others, but I just brought out vines to let you know. They're pro most of them are going to grow about one, one plant per eight foot. Seems to be pretty consistent with, I want it to be full like now. And so it'll, it'll easily. And then that lesson of trim them all back as close to the fence or close to the trellis, close to the whatever that's growing up, trim them all back, including honeysuckle. Uh, and then I'll give them a haircut on the top because they'll tend to go up and kind of go, woo kind of get kind of mangy looking, kind of like they're gonna grow and up to the roof or something. Just trim them back in January, February, March, and then they'll, that keeps them under control, and it also will bring out your bloomers, it'll bring out the flowers more. Yeah? Grapes, grapes would do really, really well, so that's a good choice too. Um, grapes will do great. Yeah, they'll do, they do wonderful, and they're loaded with grapes right now. It's a good grape year, this is really good. Harvest is like ridiculous. I don't know what to do with all my tomatoes. I don't know what to do with all the grapes. There's too many of them. They're so happy this year. 
it's kind of it's all the rain okay all right and then we got spruce got that i brought this purple leaf plum uh, this is this is probably the number one selling a spring blooming tree um, it has pink flowers usually in march sometime it's covered in pink flowers kind of announces spring but it's spring it's it's pink and then it puts these purple leaves on through the entire year so in, in july it's purple in august it's purple it's fall color is purple it's spring color is purple it's a purple leaf plum there are other varieties like flowering cherries, flowering crab apples, flowering red buds, they're all in that same ilk, same kind of plants. That's just, I don't know why it's the number one seller. So I think it's because it contrasts all the blues that we have, like oaks and that kind of stuff. Uh, it goes against our, our, our light colored rock. If you're doing a light colored, uh, like crushed granite, something like that, it, should, it contrasts really nicely with that. So it's a popular one. It's also, uh, there's no real problems with it. Deer don't eat it, javelina don't bother it. Uh, rats aren't going to get in there, scoop the, scrape the bark off. It's just low maintenance uh, and low water. So I would say it's, it's an easy care plant. It's related to the native one. There's a native prunus, the same genus. There's a native one that grows wild, has green foliage and a white flower, but they're direct cousins of each other. And that's why they naturalize so well. This one is a sunset maple. I don't know if you can see that on camera or not. And you kind of twist it over here maybe. It's starting to go in, is it showing some color? Maybe it's got a bright orange color in the fall, but this is, again, it's, it's, it will naturalize very nicely. It grows wild down, in the, down towards the uh, Granite Creek in those areas. That's the tree that you're seeing. It gets up a little taller than purple leaf plum, probably more like 30 feet. This is more like 18 feet. So it's got another 10 feet on top of it. Uh, but it's famous in the fall for its goal. I mean, just bright orange with a light tinge of gold on it. It's really, really pretty. I think it's as pretty or prettier than that red maple, the, Aud the blaze maple. It's as pretty as that and hardier. And they're both hardy. They're both tough. Just that one's real. The maples are really big. This one's a little bit smaller. And this is the cutest one of them, smallest. For a tree, 18 feet is not very tall. So that's why we line driveways and stuff with this. The lesson being, if you're zigzagging, your, your privacy screen, you want it to look more garden-esque, your evergreens are going to, they're going to grow slower. They're just, they don't grow as fast as a leafy or deciduous plant. So many times I'll plant in that, in that row, I'll plant an aspen or a maple or a purple leaf plum. I'll plant some different deciduous plants in there because it looks natural and they're going to grow twice as fast as a, as a, as an evergreen plant ever dreamed of. And so it gives me, it blocks it out while I'm out there, it blocks it out faster. And usually their growth is up here where many of the evergreens kind of grow with this columnar shape. And so it gives me that fill in up here. And yes, they're deciduous, but you really aren't out there when, they're, when, they're, when they don't have foliage. So I find it's pretty easy to kind of put just a few of them in there and you quickly get a faster screening kind of plant. That's kind of not really in the book. They don't teach you that. That's just personal experience when I want to have privacy like now. That's how I do it. Okay. That's why I brought those two trees. Now, yep. That's the flowering one. Does the fruit one grow in this area? So the fruity one does grow in this one. Actually, purple leaf plums. So the question was for you folks online, we know you're there. Hey, while you're taking a moment, let me just talk to you. We're a small company. You know what my main competitor is? Big orange and blue box. We call them Lucifer's Lows and Depots, Devil's Depot. They got an ad budget that, that's my gross sales. I can't compete. But if you hit the like button, subscribe button, oh, Google loves that. And we, get, we go to the top page. So when we, out, we, out, we beat them at their own game. So take a moment. Make a comment. Hit subscribe. We'd love it. Thank you. So anyway, um, Anyway, if you don't do that, they just, they're just voyeurism. They just don't, they don't interact. This is a live thing. You're watching live right now, unless you're looking at the repeat. And then still hit the like and subscribe button. It still helps us. So anyway, it's just kind of, we've been doing this for a lot of decades. We just hit our, we just had our millionth download on YouTube. I never guessed. We're not promoting that. And it's all locals. It's not, I don't care about someone in Australia or 
New York, just us. And so anyway, just interesting. Oh, the question was, the, the fruiting one. I do have quite a few fruiting pears, uh, um, plums. Uh, they all do well. Uh, so yeah, you, you can grow those. These mainly will put a small fruit on them. They call them fruitless, but most years, they actually put a little cherry. My kids always climbed them and ate them. They called cherries. They're about that big. They got a really sweet melt in your mouth kind of meat and a tart skin to them. They're really delicious. Uh, but if you don't want fruit, probably not the best thing. So there's better choices like crab apples. They're put on fruits, but they're not messy. They don't stain things. Uh, red, um, red buds, that big heart-shaped leaf, bright pink in the spring. Um, it has, no, it has no mess at all. And so that's maybe a better choice. So that's one I know. It's the most popular. I brought it because it's the most popular. I don't have one in my house. So, but I want to let you know what are people putting in and what are some options that are maybe better choices. That's why I bring it. So great question. Anything else before we move on? Because we're basically there. Yep. We're going to land this baby. Oh, for, for those of us who have a very small area and would like to Oh, perfect! Yeah. How do they? How do they grow? And do they have a lifespan? Yeah, absolutely great. That's a great question. So containers, for those of us that have a patio or a smaller entrance or courtyard, and we want some privacy, some things that are taller like that. What are some good choices? Let's start with what size pot. The bigger the pot, the more soil. Not not big. Just the more soil quantity. Doesn't matter if it's tall or wide. Doesn't matter. Uh, just quantity the longer it will stay in that pot. I am actually amazed at how long they'll grow in containers. So I grow, I grow uh, uh, these big upright junipers, Italian cypress, and a big white pot. It's a big pot like this, about that tall. Some of the bigger pots out here, I just use those, fill them with water spotting soil, I'll put them in there, and I'll put flowers around them when they're smaller, but eventually they fill in, they're taking up the whole bucket, whole container, and then I don't plant flowers anymore. And I'll just use, I use them on my back patio quite a bit because uh, it's just one and a half story deck above this, this big entertainment area. It feels cavernous and kind of, if it was a little bit lower, it'd feel more natural, but it's way up. There's a classic mountain house, two stories, dug into the hillside. And so I'm trying to hide those posts so it doesn't feel as, uh, just feels better. And so I put these big upright things there. And so that's it, it'd probably buy a, Oh, five, six, seven, ten years. I've got a peach tree, literally a full-on peach tree, peaches, um, and just a big square pot like this. Been in there for ten years. I mean, I'm getting tired of it. I want it to die. I want a different one. I'm just tired of it. So it's getting too big. I got to bring it back. But you can grow it in a big enough size pot. With that being said, um, two pieces of advice. Just I've got over fifty containers. Uh, bigger is better. Watch what material that that uh, container is made out of. I wouldn't use wood, like barrel, like uh, uh, whiskey barrels, because the bottom rots out of those things pretty fast. You'll pick it up and want to move it around, and it'll just the bottom will just drop right out. So that's one thing. And then really stay away from red clay or Mexican clay, because they're going to crack and fracture as our winter has this freeze thaw cycle. You'll plant it in there two years, three years in the pot's gonna just break apart on you, just, just vaporize. Use a good high-fired, your Vietnamese, Chinese, Malaysian, use a good high-fired Asian pot, and you're, you're good to go. So they, they don't break. So the, the clay is better, and they go through the kiln where they're, they're more dense. And then your soil, make sure you use a good soil. Don't use anything from the yard. You just get, fill it with water, it's potting soil, that's what they're grown in, just fill it with that, and you're good to go. Okay, yeah. Horse troughs are great. Yeah, they're good for today. They'll be aged a little bit, so they're, 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 they're trending right now. That and um, uh, straw bale gardens. That is big, made a comeback like I've never seen. It's like I'm in the 70s again. It's kind of fun, actually. Gardening's always cyclical. It's, it's had a renaissance where it's coming back. The main thing with troughs, no matter what size trough, um, make sure it's got drainage. So don't, don't, it's got a plug right there. Take that plug out. And I would even turn it over and put a few, drill a few more holes in it just to make sure that it drains. And then the big mistake I find most people make, because horse troughs are so big, they never quite fill them up enough. So they always look like they're half, what, did they run out of money? 
did, did they not fill it, but they didn't have enough to put dirt in it, or what happened? And so because they're so cavernous, they're hard to fill up to the, you know, usually containers, you should have them up to within, I don't know, two, three inches from the top. And that looks natural, and then things fill out, spill out better. If you're growing trees, definitely want more soil, would be better. So anyway, good, that's a good one, yeah. Brilliant, yep. Oh, really? They're just having fun. <laughs> so, for you folks online, she's at it. She's at, at that wildland where they got, she's on a, some sort of main highway for deer and javelina. And she's got this Virginia creeper. Where's that at? This guy. She didn't grow it up. She grew it down over the wash, and the deer have come in and pulled it up and eat it and trample on it, just have fun. They roll in it. So is it still, how long has it been in the ground? Uh, it was in the ground four years. I, I have to buy new ones every four years. Uh oh, they kind of get to, I would not, so she's having to replace them every four years because the deer are just trampling and, and eating and, and, and they just, for some reason, like them. When the hunting season starts, they come down. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they're betting right now. They are betting in the town. So that's hunt season, she said. Uh, they tend to come into her property just because they know hunters aren't allowed. You have no hunting signs on your fence, don't you? Or it's they know no hunting's there. So maybe change it up and put a different different vine on. So put honeysuckle or put something else. Try it. No, have to leave it alone. Just if if you're beating your head against the wall, Change it up. I got the Ken's two strike you're out theory. I don't go three, two. Try it once, didn't work. Eh, try it again. I would really recommend changing it up. But if you have to have that same plant, put the same one in. Try to dig the hole bigger. Take some variables out. And if it dies a second time, get a different plant or abandon that hole. Go right here and it'll probably grow here like it doesn't grow there. There you go. Let me give you a couple other things just because it's, it's autumn. And then we'll wrap this thing up. We can take a few more Q and A. We're at that point, so the topic's pretty well covered right now. Um, couple things: it is time for mums. That's a new. Uh, uh, this is called Wanda's Purple. It's just a, I have. I've grown so many plants, I get bored. So we're looking for new, fun, different. You've never seen that color before. It's only available at Waters Garden Center. Yes, you heard it here. So come on and get one. So literally, it's kind of one of those fun plants. Uh, a quick lesson about mums, there's two types of mums. There's greenhouse grown mums. Those are the ones you're going to find at the big box stores. And there's ones that are grown outdoors. You want, as gardeners, to, to have ones that are grown outdoors. Those are the ones that will be perennial. They'll come back year after year. The greenhouse grown ones are kind of wimpy. They tend to die in the winter. They can have a little bit larger flower to them sometimes. Although we've got some that are garden mums that are big. But the main thing is make sure they're grown outdoors. Not, not greenhouse, just if you want to have them come back, this should grow for decades, not just a winter. So if you're Midwest folks, you're used to this, plant it, throw it away. Here, we plant it and keep it going because it's a true, true perennial. Uh, uh, this is probably better. So javelina and deer, can't, they can eat them. Some, I have them growing right where javelina are. They seem to leave them alone. Every once in a while, fine. I think that was mainly the drought that we had a couple of years ago. Sometimes they'll eat only the flower, but I find they leave them alone though. This is a cone flower or echinacea. I brought this one just because this is its time. This is a summer through autumn bloomer. Um, I brought it because it's white. You just haven't seen white. It usually comes in pinks and purples, even reds, white you've never seen before. And they just go with things like this. This is a new penstemon. Penstemon grows wild here, but you've never seen one with purple foliage. So it's got that white, classic white flower that a lot of penstemon have. So this will grow wild, truly a wildflower, but just purple foliage, it just looks really rich. Looks unusual, it looks garden-esque. So again, we're trying to introduce new varieties that are for our area that will just winter over and kind of come back. This will actually spread through the yard. Um, these are both like they're going to hibernate underground. So with this, this is a bird attractor. What I do with this is if you pinch this flower off, it'll set another flower right through. I mean, the 
right through into November. It's amazing. What I'll do is starting the middle of October, I'll, I'll stop pruning, deadheading or pinching it. I'll let it go to seed. And I'll let that seed head stay upright through winter. And my birds that winter over with me, they'll use as a food source. It's a very heavy seed producer. And I'll let it just go to seed and I'll leave it there just for them to eat through winter. So okay, all your echinaceas, rutabecchias, Mexican hats, galardias, they're all that way. So I kind of do that for my birds. I have a lot of birds. But it's a different set of birds that winter with you than the summer ones. So they're migrating now. So anyway. What is that? Pinstamen. This is, uh, this is uh, Dakota Burgundy Bearded Tongue Pinstamen. Just call it purple pinstamen. I say it 10 times fast. <laughs> It is a time for your cold season crops. So pansies, violas, ornamental kale, edible kale, uh, edible lettuce, all your spinaches, all your leafy crops, it's time for those to go in now. So as any of those uh, plants start fading in the vegetable garden, pull them out. So if your tomato stuff's blooming, stuff's growing, just pull it out. Make room for your broccoli, your spinach, your cauliflower, your those those winter plants. And many of them you can harvest right through winter. I mean, like Christmas dinner, we have fresh lettuce, spinach, broccoli heads, cauliflower. You can have that here. Our season is so mild. It's unusual, but you can have that here in our four-season climate. So I brought that just a quick lesson. Snapdragon, snapdragon, snapdragons. This is a wildflower. It just grows for years and years, reseeds. Animals don't eat it, javelina, deer don't bother it. Looks delicious, but they don't bother it. And then uh, I mentioned all of these. These two here are companion plants. Two that are un unusual plants. Unusual in that you only find them at the garden center in the fall. You do not find these in the, in the spring or summer summertime. It's just now. This is tiger eye sumac. Sumacs do grow wild. Um, it's not a poisoned one, so you're not going to get a rash or anything. It's just a, it grows up about this tall, hip high. It is gold, like a tiger's eye, that's the name. And then it's starting to see its first leading edge of, of bright orange. So it's a, it's, a, it's a deciduous plant that has bright orange. And when it loses its foliage, it's got this real funky, soft, velvety bark to it. It's related to staghorn sumac, which gets very big. It's like 12 foot, 15 foot tall. This one's easier to maintain. If you've got chocolate colored rock, uh, those darker rocks you're covering the yard with, this looks really good because it gives you that contrast to it. I use this around my pond because ponds are very usually either they're real dark um, or they're pea soup, one of the two. And so the gold either way looks really good and kind of softens it up, makes it look, look wild, makes it look native-y. So I like it because I don't ever water it. You just get in the ground, Get it rooted, never water it again. It's fine with that. It gets hip high. Yeah, pretty much hip high. This is uh, St. John's wort. The reason I like this one, it's been in bloom for like two months. Have the, has these bright yellow flowers, about the size of a quarter. And then it puts this fruit on right afterwards. And then it'll actually turn, the fruits will actually turn color, give you dimensions. It is deciduous, it'll lose its foliage. But these berries persist right into winter. It's really fun, kind of really fun little plant that you just don't see. Full sun, I mean, blistering hot, surrounded by flagstone and rock, and it just loves that. Uh, bright sun, six hours or more. The more sun, the more flower, the more berries, the better it does. So it's a good native, kind of drought hardy, tough little plant for here, but it's called St. John's wort. We've got several different colors, but you only see them this time of year. This time, you want to put them in late summer through fall is, is when you plant these things. And that's all I've got for you. I would say you can plant now. It's don't, don't worry. This is actually probably one of the best times to plant, especially your bigger things. If you're doing hedgerow, now's the time. And now through November is probably the ideal time. Uh, and the reason being, they're gonna, again, they're gonna, the days are going to get shorter. They're going to start sending all that carbohydrate down into their roots, and their roots are going to extend out. That, they're going to store all their energy for next spring in the roots. And then they're going to come back with a vengeance. 
next spring. So you get more growth next spring by planting now. If you plant now, you do need to water through winter. You need to water no matter what, but it's critical. New plants, because the roots just, they're going to push some roots, but they're not going to push the established roots. They're just going to get really strong start. So they're, they're more dependent on you than, let's say, your other plants have been in for two, three, four, five years. They got full on roots. They're more robust. But I think you should even plant, you should even water those. Water your landscape, trees, shrubs, vines, at least twice a month through winter, starting in November. So when your landscapers are going to come in, they're going to turn the whole thing off and say, it's fine. It's not fine because we can go through winter and see zero moisture. And that's when damage is caused on plants. So just water them. Go out by hand. Water by hand if you need to. Just give it a quick. If you get a heavy snow, and heavy I mean over six inches, eight inches of snow, you can cut one of those out. But, but at least once, but I really recommend twice. Yeah, and you'll come back with a very healthy plant that, that does really well. Uh, the damage occurs on like red tip potenia, even established ones, uh, the euonymus family. They'll get this dead burned top um, out in spring, and that's called winter burn or winter kill. And what that is, that plant got dry, and then we had a real cold snap come down. You know, the weatherman, the big storm comes from the north. It goes from like 50 down to 9 degrees. Plant, dry plants don't like that. So the antifreeze they naturally have up and down that structure of that plant, it's not hydrated, so it can't move it. So it just keeps the core alive, so it lets the top go, so the tops will burn off. If they'd simply watered that a couple times a month, that would not have happened. So just some, especially for the newbies, maybe you're, you're just new to the area, that might really help you have healthier plants next spring. But right now, enjoy the the fall that's about to happen. I mean, it's, we're days away from autumn actually being here full on. October, first part of November, is usually a pretty spectacular time. The last tree to turn fall is probably Bradford pears, the ornamental uh, uh, flowering pears. Usually by Thanksgiving, first part of December, they're kind of the last tree to turn red in the fall of the year. And then it's your evergreens are going to carry you through January, February, March. And it also, actually, March starts again. Your purple leaf plums will start blooming sometime in March in between all the blizzards that we get. It's either, it's either glorious or, or snowing. You never know what you're going to get in March. That's spraying the mountains, how it works. I'll hang out afterwards, answer any questions, come look at the plants, take pictures of the plants. If you need um, our, our website, it's a great source of information. So we've got a, we're, we're listing all these plants on our shopping cart. If you want a shortcut to that, go to top 10 plants, top, the number 10 plants.com. They'll take you right and you can look at this and we don't just Google, you know, download whatever Google saying. We put, how does it grow here? How much sun does it take here? How much wind does it take here? So we're trying to very much customize it for this central highlands area that's unique to, to the, 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 more unique than more unique, uniquer, than the other parts of the country, just different than other parts of the country. So that's a great learning tool. You can hit the buy button, or you know it's here and come in and handpick your the one you want. So either way, it's there for you. With that, I'll let you go. You folks, say a thumbs up or thank you very much, or a comment would be great. I'll let you clap and leave. Thanks, you all. Appreciate it. <laughs>